If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be noted. Hello Internet, we are back. We have Ferdi van Inkerk here. I must tell you this fellow, he really talks well. And I must also tell you that when we stopped the other one, the first one, he said to me, hey, I'm not done. I have a lot of things to tell you still. And that is after he went on and told us about his wife, you know, that the army sort of got him his wife, which we are grateful for. I met some of his other kids, really wonderful people. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Ferdi, you're most welcome here, mate. We really enjoy you. Tell us what, what's happening today. You, you've been finished with Bridge 14 now. I suppose the army then called you up with, for camps. Hello. Hello, Chris, and uh, all the viewers. I think I just want to quickly start off by correcting a couple of points that I've said because you never know who's watching and and they always know better. So just the um, the Cuban commander was Roal Arguelleras that was killed on the Bridge 14 side. He, he, he detonated a landmine in his vehicle and that caused the Cubans to uh, lose a bit of uh, coordination. The... The first that I mentioned was the 26 South Africans that went up north of Lohanda, and they were evacuated from Ambritze. That's the town where the uh, SAS Kruger and the Stein um, extracted them from the beach. And then the last is the sad one is that officially South Africa acknowledged 28 dead and 100 wounded in Savannah. So yeah, it wasn't fun, but it was um, it was real. I think to start off with, I just want to quickly just wrap up some of the adventures we had in Angola, and I won't carry on too long. But it it is quite significant uh, what what happened. We withdrew, and it was a bit of a stalemate after Bridge Fourteen. The Cubans had withdrawn. Uh, the South Africans went over the bridge. And in the process of recovering uh, all the vehicles and, and, and obviously uh, covering up bodies and extracting it, four South Africans were captured. They were tiffies. Uh, they, they, they went to recover a vehicle and by chance just drove into the Cubans and they were um, captured. And it was headline news worldwide that these four guys, one was a permanent staff uh, uh, Tiffy and the, the rest was the three others were national servicemen. Anyway, during that stalemate, I think it was like shadow boxing. The guys were punching just to see uh, where the other one was, and uh, they chose uh, the bad company gun crew, which was the the Englishman, if you remember, the Engelsmanner, and they went sniping. So they would go down the road, deploy fire a couple of rounds off and see what happened. And lo and behold, there was a, a pond which had to go across one of the rivers. And that 5.5 five gun actually fell off the pond and into the river. And those 10 guys, they actually recovered the gun. They pulled it out the river. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that it was ever mentioned to the hierarchy that this 5.5 five gun went into the river. As far as I can recall, it was a hush, hush operation, but they came there with big eyes and uh, and uh, they they really got a flight there. We the rest of us then then sort of moved both and moved out and we moved into different positions, and then we got right about the twenty first of December. That that is now two weeks afterwards. Um, we we moved. We got orders that we were going to deploy and at first light. Uh, we, we're going to do a bombardment. So, you know, in artillery, typical, you move at night. That was the first time we actually deployed at night. And um, we were ready in, in, and waiting. And as the sun rise, uh, <laughs> we let by. And um, we, we did a bombardment and nothing happened. So we, we were rest of the day and we were settling in. We dug trenches. By that time, we had a bit of a covering for the rain, and we were ready to, to stay a couple of days in that position. And it was right about 
three, half past three in the afternoon, suddenly out of the bushes came South African, you know, and they were, uh, they, uh, they, they were so glad to see us. But what had transpired was, it was actually the 22nd of December, a Puma helicopter flew and was shot down. And they actually managed to land the thing and it was a swamp that they 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 disp dissipated in. If I recall, four or five of these guys were wounded. There was a major there that was badly wounded, and they had they they had walked around in the swamp, hiding. Didn't know what to do. They had no contact. They, they didn't. They couldn't get one firearm out of the helicopter. So they were they had, they had no weapons. They had nothing, and they were out of, out of food. And they heard us shooting and they came leopard crawling towards us to find out if it's a friend or foe. And the one guy said to us, he was about 100 meters off us and he heard the typical Bursi and he said, ah, F off, you know. And he said he knew he was home. So they came to us and we gave them food. We were short of rations, but we gave them food, water, and they were extracted. And all of this commotion had, had, had put the spotlight on us because suddenly we were under fire. But this was like not red eyes. This was serious firing. And we got ready. And, and we were shooting at a range of probably five kilometers, which is for a 5.5 five gun, the barrel is almost flat, you know, and um, it soon escalated because this thing was firing at a, at, a, at a tremendous rate at us and every time we got a bearing it was down a hundred down a hundred lo and behold it was a t-34 tank and it was one of the first deployments of the t-34 in the angola operation they had just landed a couple of weeks before in loanda and the cubans had deployed them what saved our bacon was that there was a a bit of a swamp between us. But the wind, it got to about 3,400 yards. This is now close in artillery terms. We had, bear in mind, we had no infantry, no panzer protection. It was us 30, 40 guys. The, the order came, Stark Firakop, which means uh, cease fire and, and, um, and, and get out of there. Of course, I can tell you one thing. The adrenaline was pumping. Now, normally it takes 10 guys to take that 5.5 gun, close the two legs, and hook it onto uh, the back of, a, of the gun tractor. M myself and my good old friend Chris Denison, we picked that gun up and we hooked it on to the back of the Magiras by ourselves. Now, there was strength from above because the rest of the guys were loading ammo and tents. And under huge fire, we raced down the road. And our hearts were in our mouths. So, yes. Which felt like a kilometer. The convoy stopped. And by this time, it was dusk. It was like dark. And we just said, keep going, keep going. And I said, no, 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 we, we're safe. And it was like a, a, a forest tipping with all the trees. So we deployed our guns in there. and. Um, now we had to go down and, and rest. And me and old Chris, we drew second beat to stand guard. So I just got into my sleeping bag and all hell breaks loose. There's a brain gun goes off, machine gun. Oi, 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 into the trenches. Now we now we're under attack. But nothing happens. There's nobody shooting back at us. So eventually the, the guy comes around, he says, now you can go back to bed now. And uh, it was a false alarm. It, it must have been only a couple of seconds in my mind. A guy shook me up and said, come on, you second beat, off you go. So me and old Chris, we toddled to the, to the guard post hole and we're sitting there and there was like behind the tree. There was a tree trunk and we had the brain gun on the tree trunk like that. And now we two lying there abreast. And the next thing, you, you hear clear footsteps. You could hear the cracking, you know, people, uh, someone walking on, on leaves. And Chris says to me, shoot. 
I said, yeah, no, 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 you first see, we go see something, you know? And we hear, hey, the next thing, oh, Chris, he nearly has heart failure. And there's a cow that came, came walking towards us and he gave him a nice big fat lick in his face. So it was, we were in the middle of a herd of cows, but we nearly, you know, but you know, when your heart races and you're lying there and you're thinking, you know, all you can see is these bloody war movies where your throat gets slut because the hero always cuts the God's throat, you know, and that's what kept through my mind is, hey, am I ain't going to have my throat slut, slut, you know? So it was adventure, but, but, that was quite a thing, having the helicopter recover and being chased by a tank, which is, I can say to you quite categorically, is, is beyond frightening because of the, the rapid fire of this. Because, you know, those guys inside that tank, the quicker they can load and shoot, the, the, you know, there's no cleaning battle. They just put it in and fire. And they, that was really a frightening episode. Then the world, the whole atmosphere started changing, and then we were told we're coming back home. And um, the convoy landed up in Sela, but I mean, I'm talking now about a serious convoy. I mean, there's, it was like a uh, two, three hundred vehicles more, and we're going along. And then the the turning point was at a river called. Yes, I wrote it down somewhere. Let me have a quick look. Uh, Quero River or something. But I'm going to post a photo of that. Uh, there's a photo of that. That It was a massive bridge. And we actually crossed the bridge over. And then the convoy stopped. And they said, no, 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 no. You three guns. And I think there was three or four the little naughty car, Panzer cars. And uh, a couple of parabats. You got to go back, and you got to stop the the Cubans from following us. Oi, oi, oi! What bad luck again! Eh? So off we go back now. So we deploy, and we every now and then we would fire, and and then lo and behold, they fire back at us. So it was quite quite interesting that we were in range of Siela. We were actually bombing the town of Siela that we was our headquarters, and. Um, the, the, the interesting thing was we actually we actually saw the the Russian helicopters in on the horizon flying in behind us, obviously not knowing where we were. But I must say I met those parabats and till today I think they must they could have been special forces guy because I've never seen guys like that. They were like thoroughbred soldiers, hard just like you would expect the parabat to look. And it gave us a nice warm feeling to know that and for once we had proper infantry doing the, the, the job of protecting the artillery. And, um, and that was interesting. And then one day a, a aircraft came flying, a Russian aircraft came flying low over. And I, I subsequently found out uh, my auditor, a guy by the name of Paul Alston, he was actually on the anti-aircraft guns situated on that bridge. And they started firing at this uh, at this thing, at this plane that flew over. And it came right above us and uh, low. And uh, it was quite nice to hear the ACA guns, whether they got it down, I'm not too sure, but it was quite eventful. And then eventually we, we, we withdrew. And then the long trick to, to South Africa, to, to Namibia started. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, those Portuguese farmhouses were absolutely just left for, and some guys were clever. They had like old, old fashioned lounge chairs and they made them, they tied them down on top of the truck's roof. And while driving, the, the one guy would be sitting on top of the roof in this on these luxury chairs, and they would, you know, that's how they travel. And as we entered the town of Santa Bandera, there's a circle. And as this truck went down the circle, this guy came down with his chair and all. And I remember the sergeant major standing there shouting at us, and it was quite funny again. He says, you don't sit on your chair, you sit inside the truck. And it was, 
it was quite quite something. I mean, it was five days. I remember Sarabandera, a lovely town, the airport with all its planes. That famous pass that cuts back like that. We came down that. And um, about halfway down, we met the first of the, the Portuguese refugees. I mean, it was quite sad to see huge convoys of civilian cars and people greeting us. And uh, yeah, so then we got back to uh, Grootfontein and it was, I promised myself, the first thing I'm going to do is buy myself a bar one or a lunch bar or something like that. And there was a Savi. And the first thing I did is I ran in there and I bought myself, after we had now got our kit back, we were back in Browns and uh, we had to hand in all, all those fancy weapons we had. And well, actually, by the way, we were promised that we would be able to get those weapons afterwards, but they landed up somewhere else. We never saw them again. The only thing that I brought back was my little uh, Yudita hat, which I subsequently lost. And then this little thing, I don't know if you want to see this. This is called a beta light. Now, it doesn't work anymore, but it's a phosphorus little light. And this I actually aimed at at night because you tie this thing up on a tree and the vision only is in the band that you aim at. And I treasure this little thing. I, I, I think I smokled it back, but, uh, you know, I don't care. This is the only thing, tangible memory I've got. And I treasure this. And then we got back to, to Poch by train eventually. And I, I think it's, it's important to mention what had happened when we got back to Poch. Because we were now war veterans. We weren't just troopies, you know. And guess what? We got fresh bombardiers out of, bomb, out of art school that is now going to be our instructors. And they were punished for months on end to come and show the troops who's boss. And boy, did they come short. I actually felt sorry for them because, you know, we used to these five five guns. So uh, he, he, this poor sod, kept saying, "Oh, we haven't got discipline, and he's going to f us up." So he, he says to us, "Take that twenty five pound a gun and run around the tree." I mean, that, we did that with our eyes closed. So we were running with this gun, you know, and you got it in this position, and two guys in the front, the rest are pushing behind. And as we're coming back, we sing singing to this guy, Simbamba, Mama, Sakhruet, which means, <laughs> you know, Simbamba, he's a little boy, you know. And this guy just couldn't handle it. And then, lo and behold, we have a, a regimental parade, and all these new guys just couldn't get their pacing right and everything. So I'll, my old friend, Lang Dirk Fenter, he shouts with that hollow voice of his, all the troops sit on your asses. So we sit down and he says, all these bombardiers, clear on. And in front of us, he humiliated them by marching them up and down, up and down. And then afterwards he said to us, these guys are war weapons. They are not your little troops to come and play with. Which is how we felt good, you know. And that sort of made the, the, the a level playing field. And I, I, I suppose they were only trying their best, but they came short. Then we clawed out eventually and got back into civilian life. I went back to my old job and, and you know, what do you do? You know, you try and tell a guy what you experience and they look at you and, you know, oh, you know. But anyway, we lived with it. And um, then we got called up. We were then divided up into a, a new regiment called Two six field regiment, and you can see this is their logo, which is the uh, famous old Raskanon, which is the the first gun, which I'll get to. And um, we did camps in 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 um, we did camps in Potchefstroom again, which was nice. But I mean, you know, you're a married man now, and now you go there and you get yeah, you sleep on the ground. It's not like a, and um, then we get called up for a three months camp. And we had to go and become infantry, which I didn't quite like. So we, we, we fulfilled an infantry role 
And by that time, the war in Southwest uh, had escalated to the Zimbabwean border. And the South African army built a, a protective electric fence there, which was quite impressive to see. And then in the middle of these, this, this uh, two uh, electric fence, they put a sisal, which is like, like a, it's a, it's an unbelievable hardy, you can't, you can't walk through it, it cuts you. And um, they had planted that inside. So we were then there patrolling up and down this fence, which was uh, a quite, an, quite a nice experience because what we subsequently one day discovered, we, we came along and there's a little old house there and we see there's a bucky standing there. And a guy comes out and he's, he's actually from Fauna and Flora. So we, what, do you, what do you do now? I'm here to catch baboons. What had happened was the baboons just went over that fence like nothing, stood with their two legs on top of this sisal and pulled out the core and the plant would die and they would eat it. So his job was to catch baboons. And, and, and But I mean, I'm talking serious big baboons on that in that Limpopo River. Eh? And then we thought, yes, because then he was telling us how he, how he catches them. And he says, you only catch what then once with one trick. So you, you always got to be one ahead in these oaks and come up with new tricks. So we stayed around. Now, every day we had to walk and then you had to give your new position. But it was too lekker, yeah, because this guy had fresh food and, and we, we were, and then every night we would radio in, we had that position, but we're not really there. And then the next day, and we were there for five days. So after, so we had three days we were out of position. But interesting enough, you had a little transistor radio. And my big hero in life is the boxer, Gerry Kutsia, because he also came from Boxburg. And the Boxburg bomber had a world title fight against Mike Weaver at Sun City when they opened up Sun City. And we listened to that fight that night. I remember standing on my knees to try and listen to this boxing fight. And uh, of course, Harry lost, but it was sad. But anyway, that was quite quite something that we that that was nice. the 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 interesting thing about that camp is, is I actually that's the story where I met my wife, where I came back to South Africa and on a on a Jippo pass, you know, we, we were my mother was officially not well. Shame she would forgive me for that, but uh, it was it was. It was interesting doing a uh, infantry role. We then did a. I uh, came back and then in let me just get my dates right. In nineteen, that was in nineteen eighty. Uh, we, uh, oh yeah, I must think this was quite. In this, I actually did something good at that camp. My infantry skills. We were walking along the banks of the Lipopa River one night late, about half uh, past four, and we saw four or five guys on the other side of the riverbank, and we knew they had seen us. So we sort of went down, and we had a, quite a good binoculars, and I looked, and they, they did look suspicious to me. And I remember we were there to catch those, eh, crossing the Lipopa River. So we said to, I, and, and I said to my platoon leader, I think, this is it, eh? But we must catch these guys. So we said, all right, let's move on. And we actually made sure they saw us. And we moved quite a long way down the river. And then in darkness, we, we came crawling back to this point. So we laid flat. And we had a cutoff group that, which I was part of just about 50 meters down. The plan was these guys were going to wait at the top of the embankment. And we would come down the river and cut them off. Of course, and lo and behold, at about three o'clock, we watch, and there they are. And they were so blase. Now they could have been, they could have been local population, or they could have been durs, but they had bicycles, you know. And yeah, they come trotting over the river. So we wait, 
And as they went up this riverbank, we came down the bottom side. And when they looked, they, they were looking down the Battle of Agana. And that's when I saw fear in people. The guys, they got such a fright. They, 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 they couldn't stand. Their legs just collapsed under them. So we tied them up and we radioed in and they got taken away. And we were told they were actually under suspicion and we were commended for actually catching them because it's very seldom that you you actually <laughs> catch one, you know, I mean, the gunner, what do we know about infantry work? But anyway, we, we felt quite proud, you know, that we had actually uh, caught somebody there. Uh, we then, that camp was fine. And then in 1983, we were called up for another three months camp into Southwest. Uh, Southwest. We then went to, and I don't know what 62 Mech was. We thought it was just another camp. And we went there as Omana. You know, and, uh, you know what an Oman in the army is, is the Otopis, you know. They, and we were with national servicemen, which was the Panzer, the infantry, and we were the artillery comp component. Again, with 5.5 five medium guns, but we did a conversion course on the 120 more mortars there. Remember in the beginning I said it's the most devastating weapon, which um, I can testify. So we did this, and uh, it was called Umatia, which is as you enter uh, the, uh, the the cup lane, which was the you know Vomberland. and um, we, we spend the time there, and then. All of a sudden, one day, we heard that, look, there's, there's things on right. And we were called into this huge briefing. And then I, I, I witnessed firsthand how the South African army had, had improved and progressed from the chaos of 75. Now, we're talking 83. The army had mechanized. Uh, they, they, it was a, a mobile army. And we had we felt that we had proper equipment. Uh, we felt that um, you know at least the command structures were working. So anyway, they lined us up and they they said we're going to go and hit this terrorist base, and it was about say a hundred k's inside of Angola, and uh, they had a detailed map drawn out of what it was and where the artillery would be firing from, how the actual uh, advance with the mobile infantry would go, and then the, the, the 90 more panzers, would, the 90 more uh, uh, rattles would go in first and clear up, and then the infantry would move in. And so it was quite a, quite a story. So we, we got into our big sawmill trucks by this time. It was the gun tractors that also improved, but it was the same old gun. So we went, all right. And they lined up on the parade ground at Umatia, and the first rattle went in a direction, and we all followed. Of course, yes, he carols. We've got to be serious here. Because I was sitting in the back of that gun tractor holding on with, dear life with my fingers through the wire mesh like this and like this. And they were bundubash. The first rattle went in a compass the heading. No matter where, if there was a fence, a bush, a tree, they just went. And 80 to 90 rattles followed. And here we are right about three quarters down this convoy with the guns and we're going along. For the first four or five minutes, we couldn't stop laughing. And then we started crying. Because it was a horrific experience. Because sitting in the back of that track and being shaken around and thrown around. and Anyway, and lo and behold, at about 11, 12 o'clock that night, our gun tractor breaks down. So now we're standing waiting because we know traditionally the tiff tiffies are the last guys. So... Eventually, now all these rattles are going around us, you know. So the one stop and he says, hey, you guys must fix this truck. There's no if he's coming. So, oh, hell. So the driver gets in there and lo, so he gets the thing going. 
So we, by this time, we're now all lying on the ground just to get our equilibrium right because of all the shaking and that. <laughs> yes, see. And there we go again. But then the last rattle comes past us and it is the tiffies. So he says, don't relax. We would have helped you anyway. But, you know, but I'm glad you're here. So we were like the second last vehicle in this convoy with the tiffy rattle right behind us. Yes, we drove through the night. Yes, it was, uh, you know, afterwards, you know, I can't explain it to somebody, but I'm sure some of the guys that's listening here uh, can share that feeling with me of sitting in the back or even in a rattle. I can just imagine what it's like sitting in that rattle going bundu bashing. And been months before the days of, of, of GPSs, you know, I mean, at first they were riding on compass bearings. So, we got to position, I would say, I say it was four, five o'clock in the morning, and we deployed our guns because at first light, it's action, that surprise element. So as the sun rises, we start firing, and now we're shooting seriously again. And what was nice is our lieutenant, by this time we had structures, we had a proper lieutenant on site, and we had radio comms. And the the it was they call it a beer post rattle, which is a control post rattle. And that radio on that truck could was joined in with the whole operation. So we as we fired, we all jumped on top of this rattle to listen to the the the, the, the guys talking, and you hear the command. Go in the rattles, uh, uh, nine, uh, rattles, 90s, go in. And we could actually hear the, the, the explosions because we were saying 14, 15 k's away, but we heard their series. And then the infantry would move in. But was the, what was the best was the, the, we heard this order, track terug for a lichaamval, you know, which means withdraw for an air attack. Yes, and two impalas appeared. And it was nice. We could actually hear the pilot. And they were circling at the top like that. And they said, all right, target identified. And in they came. The first one came in, he dropped a 500 pound bomb. But phew, we felt that, you know, that shockwave. And the second one actually came in and fired a lot of rockets, which was, was truly amazing to see. So we... we the, the infantry then went through the, 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 the position where the tours were and they, they declared it safe. And that night, we formed a huge lager with all these vehicles around this position. So they came to me and they said, listen, uh, uh, we're going to put a, a flare up and you shoot three rounds just to let them know we're still around. In case there's one in the bush hiding somewhere, we want to let them know that. So I said, okay, let's find out. The guys were exhausted. So we said, my, my number one and, my, and me, we said, all right, you guys can go and lie down. We'll handle the three shots. It's, it's not such a big thing deal for two guys can do it, you know. You, you just have to, one guy has to hold the breech and ram it, and the other one, we well, don't have to aim, you know, and pull the rope, and off she goes. So now we're sitting there waiting, and it felt like an eternity before the flare went up. Now, in my mind, I thought it was four little guns going, you know. The next thing, all 80 to 90 vehicles, they dripped. Now, they were facing outwards. And every single one firing was firing three rounds. I mean, I was so shocked that I, I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't focus. But it was there you felt the, the power of a mobile army. It was truly a magnificent experience doing, going on that operation. It was just a privilege to see how that, or the army had progressed. And yes, somebody. We felt as that we could start, we can stop and, and stop in Moscow. That's how confident we were. And um, we then came back uh, and we withdrew from there. And then, then we were deployed again 
at a place called Ungiva. Now, that is the first little town as you cross the border. There's an airfield there. And we were, then we went with the 120 more mortars because they found that the, the 55 just was pure white wise in that loose sand of Rombolant and southern Angola. It was just not a very, the 120 more mortar was better suited. So we, we deployed around this airfield, and every night we would have a little, nice little airship. We would put a, 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 a what do you call it, a verlichtingsfakkel, a flare. Uh, the, the 120 more mortar shoots quite a serious flare, and it hangs in the air. And as we would put this up, the anti-aircraft guns would try and shoot this thing out the air. And... It was just truly amazing seeing all those trays and bullets. It was such a nice, nice thing to do. So we, every night we'd shoot that. And, you know, being a slap hut gunner, we were supposed to clean our, our barrel, you know, every night. So that one day, <laughs> so and behold, our, our lieutenant walks past and he pulls the plug off the mortar and he looks down the barrel and, yes, I tell you what, we had to do push-ups. I couldn't move my arms afterwards. Eh? Yeah, I mean, that's out of the army. I haven't done a push-up for like five, six years. Yes, I, I said to this guy, no, come on, man. This is not fun anymore. He says, oh, it's not fun cleaning your barrel either. So I learned a valuable lesson there. After you fire, you clean that loop, you know. <laughs> so it was uh, quite hilarious. Let's see what else there was. Okay, then uh, it was quite quite something. Then we came back, and of course, I used my danger pay, and we got married, and everything was lekker. Then we did another camp at Poch, and then the, the second year of the it was 1984. We uh, got called up again, and this time we did a, again an infantry camp, uh, and. Uh, I remember going up by bus from Pretoria to Messina. And, you know, if you come into Port Gites, I don't know now, but in those days, there was a nice roadhouse right on the, as you came into the town. And this bus stopped. And, you know, yes, we went and it was hamburgers. And, you know, you name it. And chocolates and back in the bus. So we landed in Messina and now it's about seven, eight o'clock at night. And we see an ambulance standing there. So we line up, but there's this real little short sergeant major. We're one of those loud howlers, uh, howl, uh, howlers again. So he puts us in a, in a squat, and we start running down this little road. Yes, and the guys are full of beer and everything, with the ambulance behind us. So we went into one of these... Uh, refresher camps where they give you a crash course again. And I remember, yes, it was like really hell on earth because, you know, you had to re redo that exercise of of uh, changing positions on the brain gun. And then you got to change the barrel and, you know, the one guy has to put the magazines in. And I remember the, the this sergeant major coming and putting his boot on top of my head like that while I was lying there and he said I can see the men are working the blood is flowing you know because your fingers are cut and everything so we were then roughly a week in that camp and then we were deployed so we landed up on our first camp and it was near the the the, the, the border on, of the game reserve there's a lot of game around so my, my section leader was a, quite a tall guy, and I'll, I won't mention his name. So uh, we were just settling down, and off he went. Next thing we hear a shot go, Quah! yes, here he comes, he shot the buck. Out of his bag, pulls out all the knives, the whole set of knives. He said, he, he didn't come here to suffer, he came prepared. So needless to say, he's a master chef, and he cut the meat, and we had a ball. So I said, now, this camp, it sounds right. So we did all kinds of patrolling. And the other funny thing that, that, that I can say was, 
I mentioned earlier I was a marathon runner. But during training once, I was running cross country and I jumped over a little river and I broke my second toe. And because I was fit, I, I didn't want to stop. I just ran through the pain barrier and I never had it fixed. So, you know, there was, it was always sore if the toe bends up. So we got a, a true uh, <clears throat> warning that the ANC at that time was going to infiltrate and do an attack on Tepi's holiday resort. So we had to deploy at night. <clears throat> so the, the van, the, the Bedford would be driving and we had to jump off the back. So <clears throat> me and my friend, Algilion Fuerges, he had a bad knee. So I went to the to the Bombardier and I said to him, listen, pal, let me now be quite frank with you. If you make me jump off the back of that truck, I'm going to sue the army because I'm now telling you I've got an injury. And he says the same thing. So needless to say, as the truck goes and the guys are jumping. But, I mean, you're supposed to be under under cover, but you could hear the poor guy falling and all you hear is his food tins and his all these nice and forks rattling and as he hits the road. So it was <laughs> defeating the object. But they actually stopped the bug, the truck and he came out and he says, those injury guys, you can climb off. So we said, all right, that's nice. So we climbed off and we laid. And we then sort of moved in and we were lying around Chapis. They wanted us to actually... If you know, if people that know Chippies, there's a, a hill at the back of this. They wanted us to climb on top of this hill and hide there. But it was tourist season. And what is the thing the tourists do? They climb the kopi in the day. So, I mean, now if you lying there, you're supposed to not be seen. Uh, you know, how you hide? So that idea got scrapped. And there was like a little crawl just off the side of it. So in the day, we had to be in this crawl. And at night, we would deploy. And every hour, we had to report in all is well, you know. And um, it, it was, it never came off, that attack. But it was quite, uh, quite the, the, the army took that attack thing seriously. And we were there ready in case it did happen. It never happened, though, thank God. But uh, it, it was... Difficult to be deployed at night and un and withdraw in the morning, and um, it it was really uh, and you and you knew it was real, and um, but yeah, it, it was it was was a nice camp. Let's quickly see. Oh, the other thing that happened was that we were. We were on rat packs, you know, and I mean, you know, lying in the bush, and we were there three months. So, in the last month, our sergeant major goes to Bessina to go and draw rations. And the guy in the butcher shop says to him, When are you going to collect your meat? He says, What do you mean? He says, Your, your wet rations are lying here. So, they were in bombarded with meat. It was so bad that they, they would prepare the meat and actually call us on the radio to come out to the road and they would give us steaks, chickens. So we ate like kings in the bush there, you know. It was it was really <laughs> it was that was nice, you know. And uh, then we 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 finished that camp and that was the last sort of major uh, operational camp on it. But then, lo and behold, we, we get drawn into doing shows, you know, like military shows at, at, at the Pretoria show and at the Uppington show. So they had this helicopter, infantry, and the artillery. The funniest thing in my life was that at the Pretoria show, now, how it goes, the helicopter, the artillery comes into the stadium and you, you know, the four guns come around and 
you deploy the, the 25 pounder by, by dropping the, the the cradle that it sits on and you shoot blanks. And the first gun that that you, you pull the trigger and the shot goes off and the other guys get ready as, as they move in and then they bombard and the helicopter comes in and the civvies love it. So I was the number one gun at the Pretoria show when we come racing in and we deploy and I look at the stand next to me and it was full with Mom Mama Lordy's finest. And I said, oh, this is going to be fun. And I knew it was coming and they didn't know. And I, was, I, was, I actually faced them when I pulled the shot. And when that shot went off, they all peeled over the back of this pavilion. It was hilarious. There was guys, and if you know the old Pretoria showgrounds, there's like a glass pump at the top. It shattered the glass. The guys were falling off their chairs, you know, as these, this, this went on. And it was, it was, it was great fun. But the, 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 the problem was always cleaning the guns afterwards because, you know, that was also the lousy job. Another nice episode that I experienced that I had was that um, our emblem is two six field, as as you can see, it it is a it depicts the the ras kanon, which is the and and this is a, it's quite a quite a little bit of history. It it was a guy called Martinez Ras, like he lived on a farm built from tide in Brits. And that farm is as you come over the bridge at uh, uh, of the the, the Hartepeersport Dam to going towards Brits on that main road. That is the farm. And he was involved in the first Boer War. And the the English had set up four forts in the old Transvaal, and they they had no no artillery. So he said he can make an artillery gun. So they were. He went back to his farm at Bultfontein, and he actually from the 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 metal rings that go on the ox wagon's wheels, he casted. He made two guns, and he actually fired those guns from the over the over the Brits Valley there, and he went back. And these guns were actually. Uh, that saved and made the Boers win the first uh, war against the British because they they had these guns and now we 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 use that emblem and then on this farm they actually made it a, a, a history a national uh, attraction they they made a replica and a little museum on the farm. And we were then we went there as the uh, God of Honor, and I must say, I, I had the privilege of shaking the hand of Magnus Malone, which was probably a lot of guys would, uh, wouldn't feel the same way. But I felt quite proud of my my Minister of Defence, and he was uh, uh, in the transition to the new South Africa. He was the one sort of guy that I felt, uh, you know, I could rely on that would do the right thing for us, you know. Uh, subsequently, uh, it, it proved to be right. So I had a lot of admiration for old General Magnus Milan. And um, I think that's my adventures. Because uh, I sort of, there's much more stories I can tell. But I, I, I had a... It was a fantastic experience. I hated every minute of it, but I loved every second of it. Because the things we did and the things we had experienced, I wish my son could experience it because it would certainly give the youngsters more direction in life and give them a purpose, which I, I had from, from going in as a youngster in Poch, seeing all those things and going through that tough training and then being deployed in a war situation, uh, coming out into civilian life and, and they had, they had to adapt and then back into a bush war. And fortunately, 
I never had to go into the townships because the I think a lot of the guys would were telling us the dreadful experiences they had in the townships by being totally uh, enemies and being treated very badly. And, you know, so I never, I, I thank the Lord, I never was exposed to that. I always had the, the conventional experience and um, I cherish the memories. And I, I hope the, the, the guys that's listening, the guys and girls, enjoy a little bit of what it was like for me. And it was personally, and I must just stress, I, it happened, this is roughly 46 years ago, I might have got names wrong and dates wrong, but I've tried to be, to recollect as I, I experienced it. Ferdi, you know, I can sit here listening to you for hours and I did. <laughs> I tell you it's just fascinating. I'm really enjoying this. Thank you so much. I have a few questions though. Um, do you have any idea how that gun was recovered from the river, which the those Lorraine lost in, in Angola? How, how the hell do you get a gun out of the river? I mean, it's it's a big thing. It's heavy. Because see, there's, they, 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 there's guys around that can tell that story. I will certainly try and get you. From what I could understand, they, they tried to winch it out. And eventually they winched out. It was stuck on its side like that. And it was one hell of an uh, operation. Uh, I, I know of the guys that's on our little group that was part of that. I will certainly try and get the information and feed it back to you. But uh, it was, like they say in Africa, met a biki buita with a bit of <laughs> struggling. They recovered that gun. Yeah, because we have to remember this is not only in enemy territory, so to speak. There's, there's crocodiles in that river. There's yes. snakes, you know, there's, there's hippopotamus. There's, there's all sorts of things which can kill you besides the terrorists. You know, this yeah. is Africa. It's different. But yeah. that brings me to, to, to another question. While you guys were retreating out of Angola, because you were going back now after South Africa decided it's not worth it, we're going to withdraw. And you met this column of the Portuguese people also going south. What was the feeling from the locals towards you people when you were withdrawing? Because I do remember you said to me that you didn't guys was very, very happy to see you when you when you got there in the first place. But now you're moving back. Were they feeling betrayed or angry with you? I think I think they were very they were nervous. We I remember we overnighted in Hamburg, which was the UNITA uh, stronghold. And we were sleeping underneath the trucks. And we actually were woken up by this uh, platoon of UNITA women in, in platoon running. And these two hands offloaded ammunition that we left behind for Zavimbi. Piles and piles and piles of it. They were... I think they were quietly confident that uh, they were they were up to the task, but uh, they were. We only accounted them really in 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 Hambu. but the rest of the thing they were non. They weren't. We we actually uh, met some swapper guys that were trying to be clever, but they got uh, a bit of a fright and. Uh, got sorted out quite quickly by 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 the guys but in all i can say yeah the, the, it was uh, it was quite uh, quite surreal to see the unita guys uh they were certainly by that time a little bit more sharper but bear in mind the poor guys that were left up north uh in near near Siela and they they were just left there and it would, it, it would be interesting to see what, from a UNITA point of view, how they evacuated those guys and whether they actually just changed. Uh, another little interesting thing that comes to mind now is we, how did we know who was UNITA, who was MPLA, who was... And if he wore a hat, he was MPLA. If he didn't wear a hat, he was UNITA. The, the, the officers had pens in their pockets. So you could see from there that what what rank he was. So it was a I presume a lot of them just changed over to MPLA 
from because if you you saw the original photo on the first episode of of the the condition of these poor fighters, they were bare feet, they were underfed, they were brutally abused uh, physically for not fighting and. So um, I was, if I was an issue, I think it, it wouldn't take much for me to change sides. I don't think they understood the you know, ide ideology of uh, the socialist against the capitalist, and the you know because if you think that it was a, it was part of the Cold War, the uh, the, the the battle up there. It was, it was, way beyond the average you need the soldier. I think. Yes, it was uh, against communism. Well, that's what they told us anyway. But when you were back in South Africa now, were you under some kind of an oath of silence? Because I do recall you actually trusted the politicians when they said you will not go into Angola and then you found yourself into Ang in Angola and you had to fight your way out again. Uh, what, what's the emotions which goes through you? And I'm sure that nobody really cared even if you try to tell someone. Yeah, it, it, there was no official, talk. we were not told not to talk about it. But the best I can explain to you is when I got home and I told my folks the story, that, that the total disbelief. Um, I don't think they, 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 you know, when you tell your father you were chased by a tank and he, that you had to, Flee, I don't think they understood. It It came out later what had actually transpired there, but it was years later that slowly the, the information started coming out. The sad thing was that the, there was a, 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 there's a Savannah bond that was formed by the army. And lo and behold, it's not five years ago, the, the average gunner found out that there's a thing called the Savannah Bond, that there is actually at the war, at the, the, the Union buildings, a memorial to the, the fallen of Savannah. We were totally excluded, which just, again, uh, I say it was an elitist thing. The officers, they all knew about it. They came together every year, yet... They still didn't know who was the guys in there. They then eventually so sent us lists that we could uh, just list so that we can come onto the official uh, row call list of who was there and who wasn't there. There is still some guys that are battling to get their pro patria medals. Now, the we all got pro patria medals, but the guys in Savannah got a Kunene, a little thing that says Kunene that you put on top of the, the chespa. I don't know what you call it in English. We never got that. A lot of guys never got that. I was lucky. We actually had a formal parade. You can see me uh, in all my glory getting my pro patria medal. But a lot of guys that still haven't got that and haven't got the recognition. There's a lot of guys very bitter on who got honoris crooks and who was supposed to have got Canoris Crooks, but because of the poor, the poor record keeping, it was just never. So there's a lot of bitterness about it. But I mean, I suppose we old men, we, we, we can grumpy, be a bit grumpy now, but I don't know what the guys really want. If they want the pat on the back, I'm content. I got lovely memories and I'm happy with what we've done. But again, when you talk about it, and I hope these discussions, because I'm going to get a lot of my, my, my personal friends to, to sit and listen, and maybe they'll understand why sometimes I go a bit quirky. Maybe my wife will understand why I'm deaf. Because from all the firing, I'm tone deaf. If there's music in the background, I can't hear anything in the foreground, you know? And I think it's from all that, that, that sound of that, those guns going off. and But I live with it. And yeah, it's like I said, I'm content. I think it's called the Kunene clasp or something. Yes, clasp that's right. Whatever. I mean, we're not yeah. native English speakers here. But now I need to ask you a question which has long bothered me. Now the police, 
even if you have a bicycle, it's got a number on it, like your, like your rifle. And your dog, your police dog too, it's got a number. These guns of yours, would they also have a number like a rifle? Yes, they've got they've got a proper logbook and the history of it is there. You've got to fill in the rounds fired and all of that. So yeah, they we had a proper logbook. That's how we we saw our gun was at uh, Al Al Alamein, and <laughs> it's uh, it's mind boggling. So yeah, no, there is proper records, but of course we 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 didn't know what to fill in, how many rounds, and because I mean it was just unbelievable the amount that was shot away. And um, yeah, so I suppose that the, the, the gun, I can't remember what the gun was, but we, uh, if you look on some of the photos, my gun had the G on the side, which was the, we call it Griki, but uh, the rest of the, we all had, all the guns had numbers, yeah. And that brings me to something actually, because you mentioned Griki, you know, Griki was a small little gun. You can see that uh, the Fortrekker. Museum, isn't it? The first yes, place yeah. That place in Pretoria, what yeah. you call it. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Friki is there. It was at the Battle of uh, Blood River, where they were using it against the Zulus, the Boers. Was it possible to call your gun after your wife or after your girlfriend or something like that, uh, besides its number, even if it's not official? No, we never went that way, but a lot of guys get sentimental with their guns and they, you know, there's a difference between a rifle and a gun. Now, I did notice in the first episode, I spoke a lot about guns and I apologize. They are rifles and a gun is a gun. So, you know, it was actually drilled into us that a rifle is a rifle and a gun is an artillery weapon. So, uh, yeah, a lot of guys named it, but I think it, in our experience, we, we, as a crew, we, we, we got a name, you know, like we were the rocket busters, you know, and uh, the gun was just the tool of fulfilling it. So, uh, yeah, a lot of, some guys get sentimental, but uh, no, we, we, we just had a name for our crew. I've been called up in 94. I've been out of the police for three years by then, or two years. I got called off for a camp and then extended the damn camp for two, two months, which for me was a bit unfortunate, but we never paid any taxes on the money we got because I was officially a student. Um, but I didn't like going back because for me, I sort of lost the touch and I was now thinking like a, like a civilian and I'm not in that mood anymore. So I have to ask you about camps. When you get called up, do you actually know the guys who's called up with you or do you meet? For the first time when you when you get wherever you get. No, it's funny enough, we were the same guys. And then every year the, a, a new batch of guys would come in and uh, you know we we did roughly what eight years of camps. And that we, we were the same guys, all the same. And then what eventually happened was that our friends became lieutenants and um, one guy was at, at uh, Old Frick from Willig. I think he became a captain already by the time he was still uh, doing camps. A lot of the guys got rank. We did, we were all, it was quite funny. Everybody had rank. There was no, there was no troops. <laughs> so, you know, you were a sergeant and you were still a troop, you know. You were still running around doing kitchen duty and washing pots and pans. And I remember one night at 60 Meg, we got landed up by cleaning, uh, washing up the pots and pans in the kitchen. And, uh, you know, well, how many there is? What, over a thousand guys? So you can imagine how many pots there is. And, um, yes, I remember it was quite fun because we started singing Old Ray Pert and because it was echoing and we, just to, you know, put a bit of a positive light in a, in a crappy job, you know. And we were singing, and eventually the guys were joining in, you know, so it was, it was quite fun, you know, I, I quite enjoyed it. Another little story, I must quickly tell you what was, it is quite interesting about this thing is the letters. We were allowed to write home, but they were censored. And in Angola, they actually, if you wrote something, they would physically cut that word out, not scratch it out, they would cut it out. And I... I had written to my mom. Now, what do you write home? You know, 
you weren't allowed to say you were there. You're not allowed to talk war. So I wrote to her, why are you sleeping at night? The cows could walk in and they would start licking on you because they would come. Now they want to be milked, these cows. So you, yes, you get up and you chase the cows away. And, you know, so I wrote to the cows come and lick on us and that. And she thought it was lions, you know. So the first thing when I walked home in, she said, what was in getting to your sleeping bag? You know, so I said, no, it was cows. She said, oh, you know, she was so worried about what it was, you know. And uh, another little story, quite interesting. It's maybe below the belt a bit. In the tent next to us was two guys. They both lived in Pretoria. So one guy writes to his mother, and the other one guy writes to his girlfriend. But in this letter that he's writing to his girlfriend, he's telling her what she can do with herself. And she must take a kite and that she's this and that, and, you know, she's a bad person. It gets to the lieutenant, and the lieutenant swaps the letters. So this letter where this guy is telling his girlfriend what he thinks of her, gets to this guy's mother. So the girlfriend now gets this friendly letter and she writes back to this guy and say, do you know Kali Pistorius? Pistorius was his name. <laughs> he's such a nice guy. <laughs> Meanwhile, she didn't know that he sent the, the, the letter. We only found out that the letters were swapped. <laughs> you know, when we got the letter from his girlfriend saying to, to this second guy, if he if she if he knows this guy, meanwhile they're like sleeping next to each other, you know, in the tent. So it was was quite hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, those dear John letters actually <laughs> played a major role in my role. Yeah. And I've attended, I think, two suicides that were tracker worked to be Yeah. Now, just to explain to people, yeah, dear John is where your girlfriend or your wife, but mostly your girlfriend, you get young men, you know. Your girlfriend writes, dear John. I found somebody else. And you have to understand, this guy's away from home. He's probably away the first time. It's sad. It's really hard. And I think that is where the comradeship, you know, the mates next to him actually step up and, you know, take care of a guy yeah. at that time. Well, you, you must under, underestimate the power of letters. We were lying. Uh, the one, 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 one exercise, one little adventure I didn't tell you was that we were actually moved up towards the Kunene River. And I think our friend Esvia Maria, what was his name? The, the, the first the operational guy actually Fourier. blew that bridge up. Furi, yes. Fourier, I think in no, one of his episodes, yeah, he, he, he actually were part of the operation that blew that bridge up. Now we were there. And, um, we had moved into this on the Kanene River to the to the where the bend in the river comes, and we were in a, a Russian actual Russian position where the Russians were there. We picked up and I, I brought them home all the Russian newspapers and the a book on the Soviet Union and and, and the book was actually quite shocking. It says the fall of the Soviet Union and why it cannot be sustained. So I I, I picked up that book there and it was. It was fascinating reading, but it was, um, and, and we were there with the 120 mil mortars. So I remember at night, uh, in the afternoons, to, to sort of show our position, we would see who was the accurate to see if we can land a bomb on the tall road. And it was funny, we could, we actually achieved it, you know, to, to shoot that accurately with a mortar to land it in. In the tall road, you know, but like a little way away. And but the Russians, or the guys that were before us, built a foofy slide. Now, I don't know in English what do you call a foofy slide, but it's a cable that runs with a, another a tube over and you slide and you go over the river. And it was way over the whole Kunene River. And we had such fun there with that. Right, the whole time swimming. And I remember once I went on my own there because the other guys were tired. I said, no, I still felt like going foofy sliding. 
Because now, bear in mind, you, you, you go down and then there's a long rope and you've got to swim across the river to the other side and climb up the embankment and then you can go again. And uh, the one afternoon, we, we, we said, no, we want to we wanna catch fish. So we put nets out and we drop a mortar in the river. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, course, the next morning we get there, there's a crocodile. We never knew there were crocodiles in that river, but a big boy. So that sort of put the end to the foofy slide going on the on the on the on the foofy slide there because, you know, I I, I I awake sometimes at night and think that what would happen if a crocodile took me there when I was on my own? No one would have known what the hell had happened to me, you know. But it was it was interesting times. The uh, what I recall also on the bridge was the the, the the Roman Catholic nuns that was there. Now there was they were looking after the locals, and I, I remember them. And I don't know how they were involved in in all the conflicts later on, but they were certainly there, and we saw them traveling there. The, the, what what was also very interesting is that we. We were lying there, and, and our infantry was the, the old president's guard. And um, they were also deployed there with us. And uh, the, the first time I got involved with 3-2 uh, Battalion was a patrol came through, and we could actually see the guys coming from the, on the riverside. And they were on, in a, a patrol, but they were like 200 meters apart, these black guys, and they had one white officer. And uh, you could see this guy, they, they celebrated soldiers. They came to us and you could see they were, they were the FNLA, uh, the, the Portuguese, they spoke Portuguese among themselves. They could, they weren't speaking English. And I, I later subsequently found out that they were all the old FNLA uh, guys that were integrated. And it was great to see how the, that they were operating and, 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 and it was there. The, 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 the fundamental thing around this gun site we were there it was like a thing out of the movies where you'd see a grave with a helmet and the boots on top of the grave. And it was, it was real because there, there was a lot of Russians that died there and they were honored there and we respected their graves. But, I mean, it, it, it was quite – and they weren't there a long time before we got there because uh, – it was it was still the newspapers were fresh and and I still got the Soviet newspapers yeah you know not that anybody is interested but to me special memories and then the last thing that happened there was the morning our orders came that we had to move back to Southwest now you know standard protocol the road has to be swept for landmines and your sapper friend that spoke quite clearly said how they did that. Boy, we didn't wait for sappers. Eh? We went straight up, went. And then about halfway down that road towards uh, on Jiva, we actually found them on the road sweeping. And um, there was a bit of hard word spoken to our commandant because our commandant was in the front and we had to then wait for them to finish sweeping the road before we could come. But, but typical Dutchman, you know, we just want to get home now, you know. We, we tired of this, so yeah, it's uh, it was uh, it was funny, but not funny at the time. <laughs> well, but it's fantastic memories, you know. While you were talking about the jumping out of a moving vehicle with a lame knee and the toe which was broken and so forth, I just need to perhaps explain to people here, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Ferdi, but the idea with that is that somebody listening will not know the vehicle came to a stop. So you will think it's just a truck going there past, perhaps in a bit of a low gear, perhaps it's heavily loaded. And then the troops or the policemen just deploy out of it while it's still moving. That, that's the idea behind it. And we try to do it with our Caspers. And we soon realized that um, it's excellent training for being a paravet or something because you're hot over cop. I mean, you fall like yes. you can't believe it. I mean, the driver is supposed to keep it at a decent speed, say 20 kilometers an hour, perhaps a bit more, or perhaps less. But normally they weren't about 40, if you ask me. And I might not be uh, the most truthful witness here, but it was fast. 
And then we figured out if you can stand right at the back of a gas pan, you run full speed. The well, idea would be that then you're sort of compensating, but that doesn't work because you have to run the other way, actually. Uh, but that I didn't figure out. So there wasn't one of us who didn't fall there. You lie down there for about five minutes, just making sure you're not dead or that you're not have no broken bones. And the instructors, for that entire five minutes, they're laughing like hyenas and eat. I mean, they're just going on. It, to them, it's the greatest fun in the world. So I fully understand trying to do that in the dark. Now you're going to fall. Yeah, you know, no, no, what they don't understand, you, 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 you packed up with five days worth of rations. The rations is a tin of baked beans, a tin of peas, and a tin of meat, either bully beef or braised steak. Now, you, 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 the red pack is the size of a, a, a shoebox, a little bit smaller than a shoebox. Now, you've got to pack everything out and put it in your rack sack because you can't put five of those things in there. You, want, you can't. Put nothing else in, in your rucksack. Now you've got what? Five or six water bottles with you. You've got seven rounds of ammunition. So you weigh in, you probably got 40 kilos on the back. Now they expect you to run and jump off in the dark, no hole. Eh? They're not, not in the day you, you 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 sort of know where the ground is and you can try and <coughs> compensate. But uh, you know. It, when the guy hits the deck, all you hear is his, his Dixie rubbing against whatever he's got. To the, now, I say a Dixie is your pan that you can cook. And, <coughs> and so it makes this whole thing about being silent. It's a joke because you hear the guy cursing, swearing, and falling. And ah, it was a joke, guys. That's why I said, you stop, I climb off. And it worked. Well, I have to laugh on that as well. It brings so, so many memories to me. Well, Ferry, we've come to an end here, but I can tell all of you listening, we are not done with Ferdi as such because he said to me, and we hope and pray it will happen, that some of his mates who were with him in Angola were with him around, artillery guys, a few of them might come and speak to us. Either in a group or one by one, we don't care. You're all welcome. Because we would like to hear the stories. Because it's like all things in life. You have one view, and then you have two views, and you have three views. And you know what? It's the same thing, but different views. And that's what makes it interesting. So, Ferry, thank you very much. Thank you for contacting me. Thank you for, you know, all the hours you've put in here. You know, Franz for Reeve, a special forces guy, always say to me, thank you, Chris. Thank you for you and Rebecca for all the editing. Yes. But he also admitted to me, it takes him about, it took him about three days of preparing before he actually comes onto the show. And I'm sure that uh, Ferdi himself is nodding in front of me. Also took a few hours to prepare. And I want to say thank you for that. It's the small things which we don't always see when we just look at something. But there's a lot of work behind it. So I thank you, Ferdi. I thank everybody listening here. And I say to you, as always, if you have a story and you do have a story, Please come and tell me. Just contact me. I won't get you within six weeks, but that doesn't matter. Just come to us. Tell us, tell us your story. Uh, let the record then speak for itself. Until we meet again, God bless.